Valentine in a place known as Anigo Mine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a legend began every woman and man would always remember the time. This might actually alone who this song <laughs> were never the same. Might put you this movie the in like the top five oh. of slasher movies of all time. For you for you or for everyone? I mean I don't want to impose my views on everybody. <laughs> Isn't that what this podcast is about? Us imposing our views on everybody. <laughs> yes. This podcast is the Rotten Horror Picture Show, a horror movie podcast where we talk about movies off the Rotten Tomatoes 200 Best Horror Movies of All Time list. My name is Clay, and with me as always is Amanda. How are you doing, Amanda? I, I'm good, and I'll be even better the day you do that at karaoke. I, You could count on that, because <laughs> that's, yes, no, that's a definite. Yes, yes. Um, we are, uh, this is our 75th episode. God damn. And that means it's a wild card, which means we're doing a movie that's not on our list. We are doing a seasonably appropriate, seasonally mm. appropriate movie. We're doing 1981's My Bloody Valentine, which is I feel like is low key one of the like ten movies that I kind of started this to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> not that I have any like hard opinions on it, but I just love just this. I love this movie. Wanted to watch it. Yes. And wanted to publicly <clears throat> talk about it and yes. encourage other people to watch it as well. Yes, especially because mm. you had never seen this before. I had never seen this before. Um, I feel like it is more well known now, but is still kind of like second tier. I feel like when when I was young, a Valentine's Day themed horror movie with David Boreanaz came out called Valentine, and my brain combined the two, and I was just like, "Nah, I'm uh, I'm good." Yeah, I watched that yeah. recently. That movie has like a lot of defenders who are like, "You know, it's actually not pretty, not not that bad." No, it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, this movie is not on our list. It, it does have a fifty six percent Rotten Tomato score with a fifty two percent audience score. Which I have some words for those people. Um, <laughs> so, so you uh, you hadn't seen this. Mm-hmm. You conflated it with Valentine. Yes. Um, I this was one for me where I have seen this before a couple times. I don't remember the first time I saw it. Uh, I think this was one. This is one where it's on a list, right? Where it's like mm-hmm. wh- when you start l- looking for these movies, uh, you have your your. A level stuff like Friday the Thirteenth and Nightmare on Elm sure. Street, and then yeah. eventually you discover that after uh, Friday the Thirteenth, there was this boom of slasher movies mm-hmm. that came out. There's like 150 of them between 1979 yeah. and 1981 or something. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> this is usually on that list, usually close to the top, with like The Prowler and The Burning and stuff. Mm. Um, and then when you go a little bit deeper, you discover the joy. That is Canadian horror movies between the years 1973 <laughs> and 1989. Um, there's like it's a whole subset of of, mm. of 80s horror that is pretty good. Do like, you have other big examples? Uh, Black Christmas. Sure. Yep. yep. Um, this one. Uh, what's the other one that I really like? Uh, Hello, Mary Lou. Prom Night. Prom Night Two, which what? we watched here a few years ago for Halloween. Um, Oh, I don't know if I remember that. Well, one. we're gonna watch it eventually because cool. I'm gonna use it as a wild card. But nice. uh, it's it's um, all of David Cronenberg's movies are <laughs> yep. Canadian government pr- productions, <laughs> and they're kind of anti-government all at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know how that stuff works. The movies that he made up there, that that, that he got money from the government to make, is just <laughs> amazing. Um, but yeah, there, there's uh, there's a pocket of of Canadian horror that is is pretty solid. If you want to mm. go past the '80s, I mean, Ginger Snaps is Canadian. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Are you afraid of the dark? Was a Canadian production. If you want to count that. Are you afraid of the dark? Is the best. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so this was one I think that I saw when I started doing some digging, mm. and it was one where I think the first time I watched it, I didn't really like it interesting yeah because i think i watched it at a time where my standards were too high mm. that's not to say that you need to have low standards to enjoy this movie because i i think this is you were you were in the hipster season of your life a little bit yeah yeah i think so <laughs> um because i think it was i probably watched it on dvd mm-hmm. probably a crappy transfer yeah you know, i was like yeah well you know whatever it's not it's not this and yeah you taste change and whatnot <laughs> um i'm i was constantly looking for like the best 
of these. Mm, and this, mm-hmm. at the time, did not come across that way. Sure. I will talk about how my thought has changed since. Um, but yeah, I, I've seen this a few times, and uh, um, yeah, I like mm-hmm. it. It's a good one. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, we are going to play the trailer for you, and we'll be right back to talk about My Bloody Valentine. It's a bad time, this time of year. How many times is he going to tell this story? Oh, let him tell it. I love fairy tales. This ain't no fairy tale, little girl. If you don't take it seriously, you're a fool. (laughs) The first Valentine's dance in 20 years has to be something special. Flanders, you've got to get a lot of exercise if you're going to grapple with Gretchen. Oh, yeah? Well, I got a valentine for her that she's never going to forget. <laughs> right to the heart, huh? In this town on Valentine's Day, everybody loses their heart. Roses are red, violets are blue. One is dead, and so are you. It can't be happening again. It can't be happening again. What's going on over in Valentine Bluffs? It looks like Harry Warden's back in town. It happened once. It happened twice. Cancel the dancer, it'll happen twice. Valentine. Okay, my bloody Valentine from 1981. You know, another thing that I you <laughs> yes. conflated this with Valentine. Yes. I always <clears throat> confl- there's a band called My Bloody Valentine. Yes, yes there is. Which I always conflated as being like a n- late 90s 2000s emo band. Like when I when I heard Were you my thinking bu- they were Bullet for My Valentine? I think I was mi- mixing up that and My Chemical Romance. Oh, fair, yeah. Like I yeah. I put them in that group. Mm-hmm. They're from like 1984. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. That's very soon after this movie came out. Yes. That's like that's like a band now mm-hmm. being called uh The Quiet Place or something. <laughs> no, that's what I'm going to name my library slash bar. The Quiet Place? Yes. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um uh, it was directed by George Mahalka, oh. written by Stephen A. Miller, story by Stephen A. Miller, written by John Baird, starring Paul Kelman, Laurie Hallier, Neil Affleck, Keith Knight, Alf Humphreys, Cynthia Dale, and the proud sponsorship of Moosehead Beer. Mm-hmm. Amanda, what happens in My Bloody Valentine? Friends defy the rules of a legendary murderer and discover he is real when they start celebrating Valentine's Day. Yep. That that about covers it. Straight to the point. Yep. I love it when those w- summaries are just like, a murderer murders people. Because it's another one where <laughs> I feel like you could go deep on it if you wanted to. Yeah, the summary could have been like, TJ, who left his hometown and now has returned, is dissatisfied. For reasons with the- that are not <laughs> fully explained. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Sarah, his ex or maybe not ex girlfriend, is mm-hmm. dating his former best friend. Blah blah blah. And yeah, mm-hmm. it could just be like a super granular like. This is what every single person has done. Yeah, but it keeps it nuts and bolts, which is also what this movie does. Gotta love it. Mm -hmm. Well, Clay, some things you'll find in My Bloody Valentine include Mm -hmm. uh, sex with minors. Whoa. Whoa. What? What? You you don't like minors? What? What? What's wrong with minors? Uh, Listen, I'm sorry. Um, This will be the last episode. They're like the backbone of this country. They work so hard. Are you saying that the children are the future? Is that what you're saying? No, minors. Oh. Oh, right. Okay. I got you. Clay. Yep. Sorry. The police are coming for you, Clay. Not for me. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, you'll also find some naked miners. D- uh, oh, right. The other kind. Right. Yes, yes, Sorry. yes. Yep. The adult male kind. Yes. yes. <laughs> you know, old miners. <laughs> old miners. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like, like jumbo shrimp. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that naked shower scene I find yeah. very funny because it is uh, it, f- purely an exposition scene. Yes. That they do with a bunch of naked dudes in the shower. But I appreciate it because I feel like so many of those exposition scenes tend to be a bunch of naked women in yes. showers and then one or several of them gets murdered. This is true. And in this one, it's a bunch of dudes goofing off. Uh, this is fun. true. I actually, I was watching um, an interview with one of the actors and mm-hmm. he was saying that I this- you were going to say an interview with a vampire. <laughs> surprisingly a lot of insight to be gleaned about this movie from from interview with the vampire and rice was a huge fan um one of the actors was saying that this that scene was his first introduction into how movie magic works Mm. because he's like oh okay it's gonna be a shower scene great Mm. no problem hot shower whatever um where they were shooting at, there was no hot water. <gasps> and so the water was like 35 degrees. Oh, God. And they were pumping smoke in, like smoke, oh, smoke machine smoke. To make it look to like make steam. To make it look like steam. <sighs> so they're in there doing take after take in freezing cold water, trying to make it look like they're having a grand old time. <laughs> no wonder Soaping they were up. all scrubbing so vigorously like they had never cleaned yes. their bodies ever before. Yes. They were just desperate for some sort of heat from the friction. Yes. Um, you'll also find okay ladies wear. Okay ladies wear. When you need something to wear and you don't want it to be great, <laughs> go to okay ladies wear. How's the quality of the stuff they have there? Mm, it's okay. That's all you can ask for, I suppose. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Look, this is Canada. They it don't is. you don't need fancy ladies wear there. No. Uh, you'll also find <laughs> the return of the 80s slasher goofball. Yes, my favorite and least favorite yeah. <laughs> character trope of 80s slasher movies. Favorite to be pointed out, least favorite to experience during the movie. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what it is, but in these early 80s slashers, there's always one guy who's like the quote unquote funny guy. Yep. But everything he does is like the worst cringe worthy kind of like quote unquote joke. Yes. Um. Yeah, from Friday the 13th, it's it's... I'm. I don't remember anybody's name from Friday the Thirteenth. The guy who. The guy with the Indian headdress. Yes. And then <laughs> yes. Part three. It's <laughs> Shelley. Uh huh. Um. And it's always. Uh. It's always the guy who ends up doing like a Groucho Marx impression. Yeah, and he's kind of just doing it constantly. Yeah. Like like I never so, stops being a character. Yeah, I don't think people appreciate how much Sam Raimi brought to the horror genre. When hmm. someone who actually had a sense of humor made one of these movies. Yeah. <laughs> because yes. every time I see this horror goofball character, all I can think is like, they like we need to inject some humor into this, but the yeah. people making the movie just like aren't funny people. Yeah. Comedy's hard to write. It is. So uh, you'll also find neckerchiefs. Yeah. Or one specific neckerchief. One specific really, neckerchief. Really steals the show once it enters. <laughs> it's, so a lot of denim in this movie, too. Yes. Uh, the. <laughs> That neckerchief look. <laughs> he's look. He's trying so hard he to looks be like, like one of the village people. He does. He's trying to be brooding. <laughs> yes, and, and tough and sort of tough. Yeah, but he's head to toe in denim. Yep. with like a, a, a jaunty neckerchief on, and mm-hmm. it's just really it's hard. Tight to, little white t-shirts with the sleeves rolled up. Yeah, it's just really hard to um, be intimidated by that yes. in this particular setting. Yes. Couple that with his. Um, I don't even know what kind of Canadian accent he has. Yes. I know I know some folks from Canada and you can hear it a tiny bit in their voices sometimes, but like he has a strong regional accent of mm. some kind that I'm not familiar with and it's just like I don't I don't feel like you're a take charge action hero. <laughs> yeah, friends. I I do appreciate that they don't try to hide that this is Canada in this movie. Mm, yeah. Like a lot of time like in Black Christmas, they kind of go mm. out of their way to make it seem like it's not Canada. Right, right. They're um, like in a nondescript North American city. Yes. Yeah, make sure there's like pictures of Jimmy Carter on the wall yeah. at the police station and stuff. Uh, um, this one's pretty pretty deep into the in, into the Canadian milieu. Yes. yes. Uh, and lastly, you will find a cop plot? Question mark. Yeah. Does this count as a cop? I, I as the <sighs> foremost hater of cop plots, I don't know if this counts 
but it is a subplot about a cop yeah out there doing stuff i don't know if if it doesn't bother me because it's just not like the focus of the movie at all but yeah and and i feel like there's a difference between this cop plot and some of the other ones we've seen in that it's not quite so shoehorned in Mm -hmm. and he's not like coming at the teens all the time being like hey you get out of you know do you know what i mean like he's he's sort of he's like integrated into the movie from right right off the bat Mm -hmm. like i think we actually meet the police chief before we meet no i can't remember i can't remember in what order we get introduced to everyone but we meet him very early Mm -hmm. and it's obvious that this is a small town and he's just kind of like going around doing his job but Mm -hmm. it's not super focused on like the process Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like he's he's doing things and he's involved because the people who are getting attacked are people he knows. Right. Yeah. And it's his town. But he's not like on the radio all the time and he's not pulling his gun and like clearing houses yeah. constantly. <laughs> I think part of it is that it's the information that he's running down is stuff that he would be running i don't know i'm yeah because he's trying to figure out the whereabouts of harry warden yes and i mean nobody else is going to do that right and the fact that harry warden is a person from 20 years ago in the town Mm -hmm. is like yeah well he knew this guy right he was he was around when these the first string of murders happened yeah so he's already inherently tied to the crimes and Mm -hmm. like it makes sense that he would be (laughs) like knowledgeable about them yeah and invested in them and worried about it like not only is it his job but he's kind of like been here before yeah i think i think what makes it work is there's like actually a really good balance of how they execute this cop plot because Mm -hmm. there's a worse version of this movie where the cop is the main character yes and there's a worse version of this movie where there's no cop plot and what we end up Mm -hmm. having is like uh what's the girl's name sarah yes where sarah ends up like doing research quote unquote right right fucking being like i snuck into my dad's study while he was at work yesterday and i looked up old newspaper clippings and i would just be like oh no yeah like that's no you didn't (laughs) yeah it's it's kind of it's nice because what you got in this movie is uh this movie's my called my bloody valentine from 1981 what you've got did in this we movie, not do that no we, we did i'm just trying to <laughs> shift into the discussion portion uh what you've got in this movie is is you've got um okay back up i'm gonna back up for one second because i i'm gonna put something out there that i've never said before but it's, oh. it's something i've been thinking okay the more i watch this movie the more this might be my favorite slasher movie Ooh. because i feel like it takes all of the pre nightmare on elm street stuff Mm -hmm. and just executes it so well Mm. it's got the urban legend element Mm -hmm. the sort of campfire story element yep uh it's got the uh uh bunch of bunch of kids um having relationships yep and getting killed for it yep um it's got it's based on a a a holiday Mm -hmm. and it's just really satisfying the way everything plays out yeah. And I think one of the reasons that the cop plot actually works is because the two things that they've got, they've got the Harry Warden of it all. <laughs> yes. And then they've got the story about these these kids who want to have this party and there's like a love triangle and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, those things don't really cross over until kind of towards the end of the movie because mm. this the whoever's doing the killing mm-hmm. is going after people who were involved with what happened 20 years ago. Hmm. So he's going after the adults first, who were yeah. the contemporaries of Harry Warden. Yeah. And only after that section is over does it shift to the kids. Right. And the whole reason that they're doing this Harry Warden thing is to kind of play on your expectations of what happens in these movies mm-hmm. so you don't realize that this is actually a whodunit and it's not just like a Jason character. Right, which right. Is, There's nothing supernatural actually going on here. Right. Yeah. Uh, or, it, and it's not this killer return. It's just right. this, I mean, it's another, right. it's something else that's m- less believable than if this guy yeah. could escape from prison or whatever. But 
Um, so my question is, mm. do you think this, when you were watching this, mm. did this read as a whodunit to you at all? Like when you were, when you're getting into the last sequence, when they're mm-hmm. in the mines, mm. were you at all thinking which one of these guys is the killer? Or were you thinking that this was this Harry Warden guy who had returned? So by the time we get down into the mines. This is not a gotcha question. I'm just, I'm mm. legitimately curious. Sure. Um, gotcha. Er- <laughs> Earlier on in the movie, I think I was just like, oh, the Harry Warden thing. That's really interesting. Like, mm-hmm. like can't wait to see the crazed madman who's escaped from the prison. Mm-hmm. Um, and then by the time we get down into the mines and we had never seen Harry Warden and we had never even really gotten a scene of him like st- stalking any of the kids Mm -hmm. or interacting with any of the kids by that point i was like oh it's i think it's tj oh interesting yeah yeah like he comes back to town and then all of a sudden like he comes back to a town a failure Mm -hmm. a town he hates right all of his friends have kind of moved on from him and his girlfriend's moved on Mm -hmm. and his dad's being a dick and all of a sudden these murders start up again yeah hmm that's kind of what I was thinking. I was like, oh, he he went away to the West, which could have... <laughs> like, a, like an elf in Lord of the Rings? Yeah, that, because that was his thing, right? <laughs> right it was like he went his, to the West Coast, quote his, unquote. Yeah, which means either Vancouver or right. he went to Hollywood or something. Right, but I started to think like maybe that was just like a cover story. Maybe he was in like a mental institution sure. or something. Like yeah. I, I seriously was very suspect of him. I was like, no man would wear that neckerchief in seriousness. <laughs> No, no sane man. Yes, no sane man. No sane man yeah. would attempt to win back a girl looking like that. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer your question, uh, yeah, I, th- I think by the time we were going down into the mines, I had realized that there was more to this than just some sort of maybe like 50 or 60 year old dude has broken out of prison yeah. to come back to kill a, a, a strange and seemingly unconnected series of people. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think that's actually what works pretty well and is mm-hmm. fairly rare is that it it is both. It shifts. Yeah. Because there's no reason to expect to, to believe that this is not this returning madman because that's yep. what happens in these movies. Yep. Um, but then at a certain point, I can't I can't remember when they reveal that Harry Warden's dead. In- it's really late. Is it before the, f- the they start the final sequence? Um, because that makes the most sense. Where it's like th- the kids start getting killed, and then yeah. you find out that Harry Warden's dead. And then all of a sudden, you start going, "Oh shit!" It's, I it's, don't think so. I think okay. it's even later. than I think that. you're right. I think it might I, be I when they're coming like, down into the shaft. I think. Yes, yes, I think it's at the very end when 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 TJ and the artist formerly known as Harry Warden, quote unquote, mm-hmm. have have their final confrontation. Um, I think then it's like the, the, the chief finally comes down and he's like, who is it in there? We know it can't be Harry Warden. He died five years ago. Yeah. And then they were like, oh, it's so-and-so. And And everyone's like, no. Yeah. I think the, the place that it tips its hand Mm -hmm. for me is once it, it comes down to just the final like four where it's TJ and Axel and Sarah and Patty, uh, Patty, I, I, so I can't believe I didn't remember that because the whole time I was thinking, you never see people in movies named Patty anymore. Yeah. It's kind of just a nice, like, that is what a girl in the 80s would have been named. Yeah. 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 She would have been Patricia. Mm-hmm. She either would have been Patty or Trisha. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, when they get down to just the final four and it's lots of, like, shuffling around the mine, mm-hmm. they never cut back to, quote unquote, Harry Warden. Like, yes. there's no, I don't actually, no, I think you do, you do see him in full getup once or twice before that mo- right. moment when he's killing some of the other people. But by that point in the movie, once we're down in the mine, There's... The, the two lead men have both put on their miners' outfits. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they're, and both of them are together. Yes. So there's no way you could cut back to, to Harry. Yeah. Yeah. And then it makes it in retrospect, you realize that there are, there are big chunks of the party where mm-hmm. you don't know where either one of them is. There is, there is one mo- moment Mm-hmm. Where I feel like it, it comes really close to breaking, you know, mm. s- the physics of space and time. Mm-hmm. Where I think it's when the new wave kid gets his face boiled. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> Axel 
leaves the party Mm -hmm. to go off and cry somewhere, (laughs) changes into his miner's outfit, sneaks back in, kills that guy, Mm -hmm. and then escapes and put takes everything off and then comes back like seconds later. Mm. And that's the one where it's like, okay, well, I mean, the magic of movies, but right, right. But generally, I think they handle it pretty well and they play pretty fair with it. Yeah, I think so too. I I I think there's not a ton. There's not a ton that would give you any sort of tip off really early on. It, it's mm-hmm. it's in a weird way. It's remi- it reminded me of a bunch of the um, Argento movies that we've watched recently. Mm. Well, the 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 reason for his break is mm. fairly similar to like Deep Red. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And but but in in the same way that like the bird with the crystal plumage doesn't show you the audience mm. the piece right. that you need. To realize that this is a whodunit and figure out the puzzle, this movie does the same thing where it then it had shown a flashback of Harry Warden's original murders. Mm -hmm. And then when they show that flashback the second time, they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's the night that Axel's father was murdered. It's like you see little little boy Axel just watch his dad get a miner's pick to the chest and actively deceiving the audience. Terrible movie. (laughs) Zero Uh, out of 10 stars. Yes. Uh, Yeah. I and it's. It's just a, it's a really interesting setup because yeah, you've since since you've got these quote unquote kids because I don't know yeah. how old these people are supposed to we be. We had this we had this conversation. It was a fairly long conversation. Yes, and it and it got. I feel like the longer I think about it, the more um sort of like <laughs> like like uh, political sciencey I start to get about it in my head, mm-hmm. where I'm like, well, maybe it has to do with like the socioeconomics. <laughs> of the town <laughs> what was what what were the conditions like in canada for for the people of this area uh uh and how does that affect yes. who the ages of people going to work in mines? right yeah because because our, our our central kind of question back and forth to each other was like how old are these people yes like they are referred to by the older generation as kids which sure mm-hmm. you know but they are working the men are working full-time in the mine Mm -hmm. seem to have been for a while yes yes at least a couple years Mm -hmm. because tj had time to leave and come back yeah um the women i don't know i don't know what they do sandwiches and stuff but like are they in school yeah good question like and that's the thing that i kept coming back to where i was like i mean i guess in 1980 or whatever you didn't have to finish high school to go work in the mine probably sure yeah like i'm i'm guessing they would say like ah come work for a few years if you want to go back to school once you've made some money and established yourself sure do it then Mm -hmm. um but you're only young and able-bodied for so long right come work in the mine now make make your money yeah based on what we see in this movie the women spend their times hanging party decorations and being happy to see the men yes (laughs) Which was weird because I was like, okay, I buy it if they're like, these are your high school aged girlfriends, Mm -hmm. right? Like they go to school during the day and then when school is done, they get to have fun with their, you know, burly minor boyfriends and plan, you know, the Valentine's Day dance, which feels like a very high school thing. That, to be yeah, doing, that's the other to be thing. Planning a, like a dance with like paper decorations and like yeah. garlands and streamers and stuff. I found myself thinking this is just like a town dance, which, which I again it, it's like, like not like uncommon, I guess. But. Yes, and for the time period <laughs> and the geography, if this is a small mining town somewhere in mm-hmm. Canada, sure, you got to entertain yourself somehow. There's no reason to believe. Or to not believe that the mm. people we see in this movie are the only people who live in this town. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I so I I have a I have a coworker, and he is from a very small town, um, in Alberta, and it is four hundred miles north of Edmonton. Wow. Which is already pretty far north from like the U- Canada U.S. border. Yeah. And he's like closer to the Northwest Territories. <laughs> than he is to the united states damn um yeah and his town his like town he grew up in is like tiny he's shown it to me on like google earth and it's just been like yep there is the gas station Mm -hmm. there is the supermarket Mm -hmm. there is the movie theater Mm -hmm. there is the school Mm -hmm. the end and then a bunch of houses like that's it yeah yeah so maybe yeah i i feel like if i had to 
I'm sure there's probably an answer I could look up, but it's more fun to speculate. <laughs> uh, I, Which is the alternate ti- the al- alternate title to this podcast. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to yeah. the Ryan Har- Har Picture Show, colon, Clay doesn't want to do any research. <laughs> Not just Clay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, you want to, you just don't. <laughs> Which I feel like Which speaks is worse. worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I feel like I I feel like you can probably safely place them in like their early twenties. Yeah. Because that yeah. would give. They're like nineteen to twenty two. Yeah. Let's say they yeah. did graduate high school. Mm-hmm. That gives TJ enough time to leave, mm-hmm. wash out, and come back. You know, sure. so it would yeah. be like the length of going to college or something yeah yeah or a year or two or whatever yeah 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 so i i think it's safe to put because i was thinking too as we were talking about it the other night i was like well i wonder how old i mean like how old are the actors i was like well you can't go by that because some of these actors are probably 19 and some of them are probably 28 yeah a couple of those men look like they were 32 yes and they were playing like i'm a 20 year old minor Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like no sir you are wilford brimley yes that guy is great (laughs) he's awesome great mustache i wish you know, just to 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 do like a therapy session here. Okay. I wish I had half the confidence that guy had when when I was his age, quote yeah. unquote. That guy's awesome. Yeah. I sh- I feel like I wa- I look at him and I go, I could pull that mustache off. Yeah. Your silence is deafening. No, I'm just thinking like, what 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 made that mustache work? Was it was it the man or was it the setting? Mm. You know. Yeah. You do yeah. have you do have the jacket that uh, that they wore during the harmonica duel, and you do pull that jacket off. That, oh, thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if that mustache works so well in suburban Massachusetts in twenty twenty three. Yeah, but, uh, I feel like that mustache has been poisoned. I'll by... save I'll save that for when I yeah. go on vacation to the Northwest Territories. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's it's interesting to me. The setup of this movie, because you've yeah. got these kids, mm-hmm. quote unquote. Sure, we can just call them kids. Just call them kids. Yeah. I'm tired of saying quote unquote. And whenever I, <laughs> I'm going to just refer to the killer as Harry Warden because it's easier. Yes. Uh, you've got these kids who are uh, preparing for this Valentine's Day thing. Right. And you know, because this is a slasher film, mm-hmm. that eventually these kids are going to start getting killed. Yes. But they don't start getting killed until like over an hour into the movie. Yeah. And there's this build up built into it where they're sort of their actions are sort of summoning Harry Warden mm-hmm. back and he's just like chomping through all of these other people to get yes, to them. Yes, all of the adults who are kind of trying to provide these kids cover. Yeah. Get like chewed up and spat out. It's almost so I I think I said this when we were watching it, but it feels kind of like a Nightmare on Elm Street a little bit. Yeah. In in and it almost feels like a I don't want to say a better version of that story because mm. I love that movie, but mm-hmm. like, as far as uh, killer comes back to take mm-hmm. revenge on people, mm-hmm. it makes more sense that he goes through the adults first. Yes, who were there, yes. who were the ones who put him away, and that the adults are the ones who are um, worried about him. Yeah, like the adults are the ones who are like, "Oh shit, we got to cancel the dance. We got to watch out. We have to be like on top of this. Yeah, we need to, you know, lock up the union hall. Make sure the kids aren't having any parties. Maybe we'll call the next town over for help. Like they are the ones who are scared because they remembered this guy. They they were right. they were there. And regardless of how old exactly the kids were supposed to be in this movie, they were certainly young enough that they didn't remember, even if they were alive. Yeah. Like, Axel's probably, what, like, four in that flashback? Three or four? Yeah, probably somewhere in there, yeah. So if it's 20 years, maybe they're all early 20s, early to mid-20s. Sure, yeah. But they're not going to remember, like, all of the stuff that happened back then. Yeah. What the adults are. There's another version of this movie that Mm -hmm. I feel like makes, quote, more sense. (laughs) Yeah. But, again, I don't think would be as much fun Yeah. where... Your finale involves TJ's dad mm. as well, and then wh- when you get into it, you find out that the explosion caused in the mine that ended up right. killing everybody and driving Harry Warden insane was a result of gross negligence on the part of his dad who owned the mine. Or some right, shit like right. That. A level, a level <clears throat> beyond just the supervisors who were supposed to be on duty didn't stick around. 
and there was yeah. an accident yeah which is what happens in in the story but that's more of that's more of like a case of like shirking your duty and being like a little bit negligent right if those supervisors had been there i don't actually know how they could have prevented that explosion yeah, I don't know. Like, maybe they just would have been there to call for help quicker. I think that was yeah. more part of it, was that they would have gotten rescue teams out there faster for people. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. There's there's a there's a, a different version of this movie where it turns into, like, a case of corporate malfeasance <laughs> instead yeah. of just, like, like, you know, I can't, some people are irresponsible. <laughs> they remade this movie in 2009, I As think. As they remade, remade many movies. Yeah, and it's one of those ones where people are like, it's actually really good, and it's actually higher rating than the original on Rotten Tomatoes. Is this like the Black Christmas one? I think so, because it fucking sucks. I, I watched it last year, and I thought it was terrible. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember if they do something like that in there. I don't think they do, but I can't yeah. 100% remember. But like that makes more screenwriting sense. Sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, because you go back to Friday the 13th. Why is she killing everybody? There's mm-hmm. a direct connection between the negligence causing the death of her son. Yep. And she's taking that out on everybody. It's, and this one, it's like they're not they're not really connected. He, he's basically just gone insane, Axel. Yeah. yeah. And- you could argue that right. What did Mabel have to do with any of this? Right, like <laughs> she's just the nice lady who owns the laundromat. He's and wants kind to date of date with the police chief. That's yeah, it. he's kind of taking revenge. Yeah, in this weird like six degrees of Kevin Bacon sort of thing, where it's like, well, yeah. his dad was killed by Harry Warden. Harry Warden was driven to kill by what happened in the mine. And the other people who were involved that way. Yeah, and the, I don't that, even think it's revenge. I think it's this. Yeah, weird, I'm not really sure. This weird, like he he's made himself identify with Harry Warden because he should yeah. hate Harry Warden. Yeah. Harry Warden killed his dad. Right. Yeah. And instead, he's like emulating him and kind of becoming him. Yeah. So like in Halloween ends. Yeah. Or like in um, Evil doesn't die, just changes shape. What is what is that Christmas movie? Black Christmas. <laughs> No, the one with the the Santa jingle, the, jingle all the way. The one with the oh, with the kid who um, sees Santa murder Silent everybody. Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yes, yes, yes. yeah, ver- yes, there we very go. similar. Yeah, <laughs> we got there eventually. Yeah. as a team. But yeah, it's 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 you start thinking about it, and it's like, well, why does he? So what what sets him off? Is it that was going to be my next question? Where it's like, is it TJ coming back and and trying to take back his girlfriend? Yeah, is it is it the valentine's because i mean right. the valentine's thing would theoretically be a reason that it would set him off because his dad was killed right. during that whole thing yes so i feel know. like that makes more sense to me than it being like specifically around tj yeah I because think so then too. i think that that version of the movie you would have seen tj and sarah targeted more specifically mm. whereas i think in this movie they're they're kind of not yeah you know like they end up surviving to the end but they're they're sort of mixed they're even split up for big chunks of the movie mm-hmm. they're kind of just mixed in with everybody else so i don't think it's like specific to like oh he came back and now i have to go crazy and kill right him. yeah <laughs> um one of the things that i think sets this movie apart for me mm. is i think this is a great rebuttal to that sean cunningham quote that we've talked about a few times yep. where he says the key to a great horror slasher movie is to put a bunch of people who are fucking terrible that you Mm -hmm. can't wait to see killed on screen Mm -hmm. and just let it happen or whatever this movie is so sean cunningham who hurt you (laughs) uh this movie is so much more effective Mm. be simply because all of these kids feel real yep their relationships feel real Mm -hmm. they feel like they actually like each other yes and like the romance in this movie doesn't feel like slasher movie romance where Mm -hmm. it's just like i'm gonna go wait down by the pool with my shirt off right or like or (laughs) you know or uh you know uh, i'm I'm gonna have sex with this girl to show my friend i'm not a dead fuck or whatever from you know (laughs) right or the lead girl being like well gee i've never had a boyfriend before it's like no, she had yeah. a boyfriend, and then he left, so she dated this other guy. Yeah, like, it's it's more in line. I know. I just, shut up, Clay. Yeah, it's more <laughs> in line with the tradition of Black Christmas. Shut up, Clay. <laughs> where there's actually some realistic, yeah, complicated relationship stuff here in the middle. Yeah, because 
Uh, whether you, whether or not you think she should choose either of these guys, mm. the answer is probably no. No. Um, that's a very realistic situation. Like, you, yeah. I, it's very easy to think like, okay, her boyfriend leaves. She starts dating this other guy. Her boyfriend yeah. comes back. Eh, maybe she doesn't know. Right, right. You have complicated feelings because yeah. that's probably the boyfriend who left was probably your first serious boyfriend. Mm-hmm. You didn't know what happened to him because that, that was part of the plot as they say to him, like, look, you left. You it seems clear left. that he just fucks off. Yeah, yeah. He, I think I think Axel even kind of says to him, like, you didn't tell anybody where you were going. We didn't know what you were doing. We didn't know if you were okay. Mm-hmm. So we all had to just move on. Yeah. And so, yeah, of course, that would leave you with complicated feelings. This guy comes back and you're like, oh, I was in love with him. Mm. And I'm so glad he's okay. Like, I'm so relieved he's he's safe. He's home. Part of me is really excited to see him again. Part of me is still really hurt. Yeah. Like, I feel like he owes me something. He owes me an apology. But also, I've been dating this other guy who's like, he's he's been good to me. He's mm-hmm. been a nice guy, but he wasn't my original love. Like, yeah, you can see why she would be torn. <clears throat> Yeah, and I don't think TJ. Um, well, we can recommends get into himself very yeah. well. <laughs> we can get into that in a minute, but yeah, one of the I think what's so fascinating about a lot of the things in this movie mm. is how vague the circumstances are. Yes, like you were just saying, we don't really know where TJ went. Yep, uh, we don't really know what these kids do other than work in a mine. Yep, we don't really know what's going on uh, with the, the these three. Other than the fact that it's like they both, it's just a love triangle kind of right. thing. Why do you think that this works so well, mm. given so little actual information? Is it? Do you think it's because the stuff that we are given is so archetypal, for lack of a better word, where it's like this is very relatable stuff, and they just play it well? Yeah, I, I, I think that's part of it. I definitely do. I think, I think it's sort of like. Who hasn't had that situation or a similar situation in your life where you feel complicated feelings about two people at the same time? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's really common where it's like, oh, I have a crush on this person, but also like this person's always been there for me. Anytime I open a Twix. (laughs) Yeah. You're just just so torn. Nightmare. Yeah. Just the emotional turmoil you go through. Yeah. Um, that's I why also, I go for Twix Mini because it never breaks your heart. There's just one of them. Yep. Yeah. Um, you're a truly monogamous man. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other one of the things I, I like about this movie too that I think helps all of this work mm-hmm. is that we are supposed to feel like these people have known each other their whole lives. Yeah, I think it's and we do. I think it comes across yeah yeah and i i think that's what kind of makes this different than a lot of the other slasher movies where it's like they've met at high school or they met when they moved to college or they're you know staying at a vacation house on a lake and the Mm -hmm. people in the cabin next door are young and hot and like i'm gonna go see what their party's about yeah it's like no these are people whose families all know each other they've they've grown up together even though they're young, some of these couples have probably been together for like ten years. They definitely feel that way. Yeah, yeah. like like the the big dude with the mustache and yes. Patty. Yes, it feels like they started dating in like the eighth grade. Right, and, and they're, they're like, gonna get married ex- soon. Exactly. Yeah. They're like he's just saving up for a ring, and they're already planning like the house that they want. Oh, like oh, you know, my dad has a piece of land on the edge of town mm-hmm. that we can build our own house. Like they feel very certain about their lives and about each other. They seem very sure that like oh yeah this is my person this is my town these are my friends Mm -hmm. and this is what we do like we work together in the mines we decorate for town events together we throw dumb parties where we drink bad beer Mm -hmm. and fucking howard snorts coke out of a coke can through his nostrils that joke never gets old (laughs) you get you get two (laughs) nostrils so once one runs its course you got the other one yeah fresh joke once again Mm -hmm. It's but not yeah. even a Coke can. If it was a Coke can, it would be better. <laughs> right. That's from Demons. <laughs> I watched yes, that recently, yeah. too. That's what I'm getting Wait, at. Was that, was that a direct shot across the bow to My Bloody Valentine that they didn't do the Coke gag right because they didn't have an actual Coke can? Yes. I choose to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's what makes a lot of this work, in yeah. my opinion, is that like the actors they got seem to have chemistry with one another. Yeah. Like they have a certain charisma. There's like, 
you feel like they've kind of they have like well trod arguments and patterns and like Howard pisses everybody off but at the same time they're like well you know come on it's it's Howard he's harmless he's he's been our best friend since fifth grade yeah yeah and uh it it presents these people in this town in a way that I feel like is different than usual because mm. Um, so as you're saying, TJ doesn't exactly come off as though he's the right choice here. <laughs> right. Uh, he yes. kind of comes breezing back into town with his little neckerchief yeah. on. Yeah, being like, I'm going to get a job back at my dad's mine. Yeah. My and... dad who owns the mine and is also the mayor. Yes, which I did not realize until you told that to me before we started. <laughs> um, which but... also like adds another patina of like shittiness to him. Right. Where it's like, yeah. you are the prince of this town. And like I think you're the golden son, like your dad runs the town and owns its biggest industry. Yeah. And I think there's another again, there's another version of this movie where the town mm-hmm. becomes part of the th- the negative aspect of the story. The Stephen King version of yes. this <laughs> story. Where yeah. TJ, it, you know, it becomes about TJ saving sarah from this shit you know like right if not literally like metaphorically right right of, of essentially the narrative affirming that he was right to try and escape right and that it was a place that you should want to leave behind yeah and what they do in this what i i think they're doing this on purpose is mm-hmm. they make tj look like a shithead yes <laughs> they and i think part of this is to to make the uh, make the whodunit work a little better mm-hmm. but they make axel pretty um uh sympathetic yeah like, yeah especially early on in the movie he's downright endearing yeah and yeah. even even though they're fighting about it you know harmonica right. duets aside it was a duel <laughs> <laughs> not a duet it's a duel um there's that moment at the party when he yeah. leaves and starts crying yeah like they specifically show him have like a breakdown mm-hmm. over his relationship and he's he's a lot more sympathetic than TJ comes across. Yeah. But TJ is positioned as the sort of like the hero sort of of the movie. Mm-hmm. But everybody else in the movie is so much more interesting and endearing than TJ. Yes. And it's like even the scenes where they're at the bar and stuff and they've got their, you know, body mm-hmm. limericks they sing about the waitress and whatnot. Right. But she's one of their friends. Right. She ends up at the party with them later on. Yeah. Which is really interesting to realize as you're watching the movie because in a in a different and worse version of this i think they would have sung that song and it would have been cruel yes and it would have been upsetting and it would have been like look at these assholes right yeah. you know they're just they're they're just low lives because they're like you know they're oh they're only minors they're never gonna be anything more than that well, and until so, they grow up right <laughs> but it, yeah it, it resists the urge to portray them as assholes i think yeah where like a lot of the times in movies like this when there are when there are characters who are like they're going to be blue collar Mm -hmm. and that's kind of their career path and that's what they're happy with it's portrayed as like a shortcoming very often yeah it's like like a lack of imagination or a lack of ability and so you're just stuck with this yeah there's a version of this i think where tj's TJ's hanging out with his buddies from the mine mm-hmm. and it's closer to like yeah he's quoting Kant and they're yeah. all like <laughs> <laughs> and when his buddy like hanging out with his buddies at the bar is closer to like fire walk with me where yes. it's like yes they're being sleazy they're going to like a strip club or something and you're really playing it off as like oh these guys are gross yeah mm-hmm. and they're real awful to the women yeah and it's kind of just like well what do you expect in a town like this like this right. is how women get treated yeah. and instead it's like no like Everyone seems pretty decent. Like yeah. they're decent human beings. Yeah, there's, there's. I, f- I feel like there's a definite urge, or could be a definite urge, mm-hmm. to do this as a the sins of the town type yes, movie. Yes, and they don't do that. Yeah, and I find that to be so much more interesting and refreshing. Yeah, you know, so you don't have those scenes where like, <laughs> where I mean, you kind of do a little bit, but mm-hmm. you don't have those scenes where like the cop. And TJ's dad are huddling together and it's like mm-hmm. Harry Warden's back because of what we did. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Because they, they didn't do anything. Right. Like they did. They did the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> Axel just went a little crazy. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I like that. I think when you compare that to a lot of slashers where the instinct is like the Sean Cunningham quote mm-hmm. says to sort of pull together a, a, a rather loathsome cast of characters 
And when you couple that with the fact that so often, like, I feel like most slashers are especially targeting, like, middle or upper class young people. Yes. Like, yeah. you don't see... You mean, like, the lower middle class of Scream? <laughs> right, yeah, where they just live in, like, a normal mansion yeah, and not a like, huge mansion. Just like you and I did when we were right. 18. Or even in, in Halloween, you know, like, Lori and her friends are, like, their families are well oh, off. Sure. They're yeah. living in, like, an affluent suburb. Yeah. And I and I wonder, I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, go for it. I wonder how much of that comes down to the archetype thing, because mm-hmm. all of those, all of these other movies are generally picking and choosing. It's like, it's like you're putting together a Final Fantasy team. Right, where it's like like Cabin in the Woods. <laughs> Sorry, my head went to the video games Final Fantasy. Oh no, that's I was so I mine too, but I was <laughs> okay. thinking of like the original version of Final Fantasy, where it's like you pick a mage mm. and you pick a, a, a got fighter. It. Got it. It's like it's the Cabin in the Woods thing, right? Yes. Where it's like you've yes. got your jock, you've got your blah blah blah, you've got yep. your you yep. know, yeah yeah your goofy guy, all the archetypes. Yeah, and you're you filling never in these slots. Yeah, and you never feel like these people actually hang out with each other. Right. And I, I wonder if that's part of the upper middle class thing where it's like mm-hmm. these are all character archetypes that are generally kind of right in the middle and don't yeah. really have any um, cares mm-hmm. outside of the immediate thing that they're dealing with in the movie. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I think this is interesting because it doesn't do that. And then it also resists the urge to stereotype these kids. Yeah. And the town that they come from. Like... It's a small town. It doesn't seem like it's very rich, but it seems like a nice town. Mm. You know, like the people there seem like they give a shit about <laughs> each other. Yeah. And like even even early on when Howard, the kind of uh, the 80s slasher goofball mm-hmm. of, of the crew, pulls the prank on Mabel, the poor laundromat yeah. owner. And he he does it and he he fakes that he's covered. He comes out of the, the, the dance hall covered in like, ketchup or whatever to try and make it look like blood and she screams and it upsets her and the mayor's there and the 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 police chief's there and they kind of are like you asshole like (laughs) clean this up what's wrong with you Mm -hmm. and then later on you know mabel says or does something and howard kind of looks at her and he goes sorry yeah yes yeah you know and it is this kind of moment where even that sort of obnoxious character clearly realizes that he upset this nice lady and Mm -hmm. he's like oh that was now I don't feel good like yeah. that that did make me feel like a joke I'm sorry and she kind of just like she ends up like smiling at him and kind of just like rolls her eyes a little bit and it's yeah. like oh it's clear she's known him since he was a little kid and she's kind yeah. of like oh Howard you're, you and your antics like she's able to forgive him mm-hmm. so it's it's kind of this beautiful little town that like I don't know. I even found like uh, Mabel and the chief's little romance that never mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. is really sweet and really sad. And it does make you feel like when these characters die or are put in peril, like all of a sudden I, you know, you, you give so much more of a shit. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. You really care when you start seeing this stuff happening. Cause you're like, no, Mabel's just a sweet lady. Like, why are you bothering her? Right. Yeah. Her? What, what did she do to the mind? Why does she need to be murdered and stuffed in a dryer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so yeah. when you get to when these kids start getting killed mm-hmm. it, you know when when your couple goes off by themselves mm-hmm. to hook up which they they go out of their way yep to bring condom with them yes which is very rare for these movies yes um, canada man yeah they just they're they're all about like health care doing the right thing <laughs> but like um you, f- I, I felt legitimately bad when when those two yeah. died, especially because the guy who played I don't remember the character's name, but the mm. the bo- the guy, he reacts in a way that is so unusual for one of these movies because he seems like he is actively affected by the fact that his girlfriend was just fucking murdered yeah. and stuck on a shower yes. hose yes. in a amazing effect. Yes. But like for the rest of the movie he's like catatonic. Right. Right. Like he's like off the board. Yeah. Once that happens. Instead of and it and it saves this movie from falling into the the criticisms I think of you get from the slasher genre which is mm-hmm. oh it's just these kids are just here to be killed and right. like once they're killed people kind of forget they were even there yeah once you see the bl- this blood splatter it's like okay put them in the trash onto the right. next one right the i mean it, it honestly seems like the o- one of the only reasons that the kids even go forward with the party is that up up at 
up till that point in the movie, the only person who's been killed is Mabel. Mm-hmm. Like when they're when they when the dance gets shut down, and they yeah. decide they're gonna have a party anyway, and they're gonna do it at the mines. They're hanging out at the bar when they decide that. Yep. And they don't know that Mabel was killed. Right. Because yeah. And then the, the bartender gets killed after that. Exactly. Which they don't know about. Right. Yeah. So they're not even the kinds of kids and slashers who are like, oh, so what if somebody else in the town was murdered? Right. Like, yeah. oh, a serial it's killer's not, on the loose? I don't care. It's My not the scream birthday thing. is happening. Right. It's <laughs> like, not the scream thing. Right. Yeah. So they don't even come off as that sort of like oblivious and or selfish However, thing. Mm-hmm. I will say. Mm-hmm. For a movie that paints this group, this group of people as coming from a very small town where everybody knows everybody, yeah, nobody seems to know or care about that first girl who gets killed. Yeah, <laughs> what is that all about? <laughs> like, who is she? I don't know. She's from out of town. I get maybe. Yeah. I guess maybe it's like Fright Night. Maybe she's a hooker. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Um, speaking of that, speaking of hookers, speaking of hookers, always. Yeah. Uh, another reason I love this movie and I think it's great is. I think this movie has some of the best gore, mm. like effective wise and executed wise, mm. as far as execution goes. This movie literally was literally and figurative. Yes, yes, this movie was a uh, uh, hundred minutes when it was released, mm-hmm. and it was heavily cut. Mm. And by heavily cut, apparently that means by three minutes, <laughs> uh, because the unrated cut yeah. is three minutes. Is three minutes longer, one hundred thirty-three minutes, which is the one you should watch because it was entirely gore stuff. Yeah. And the stuff they put back in is so good Mm -hmm. that it's a shame that they cut it out and probably really did some damage to the movie. Sure. Um, Yeah. Because like without it, I feel like this with the stuff that they took out, this is it doesn't have the teeth that it does when you when you actually see what they were doing. Yeah. Um, Because that opening scene with the girl in the mine, you get this great shot of the the spike coming out through her chest, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, The death of the, um, one of the big, really heavily edited ones was the death of the bartender. Ah, yes. Who gets a pickaxe through the bottom of the jaw. Right. And it comes out through his eyeball. Yeah, the curved blade pops his eye out. Yeah, it's awesome. (laughs) Um, But, you you know, they cut the the shower scene down. Mm. They cut uh, the nail gun on the head thing down. Ooh, yeah. They cut Mabel's stuff way down so you don't see. Understandably, yeah. That shit is awesome. Yeah. That body in the dryer. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Yeah. I will say, I think think in this movie, the, the death, the worst death in this movie is the kid who gets murdered in the kitchen. The boy. Worst as in like... The one I would want the least. Oh, okay. All right. Because, here is my logic, not only does he get drowned slash boiled to death in a pot of boiling water, it's a pot of hot dog water. (laughs) There's... The lead up so, to like, that. So, like, your death would not only be scalding and painful and terrifying, but it would also smell and taste like hot dogs. Yeah. The I lead up to that, that to is so sensation. funny. <laughs> the lead up to that is so funny, too, because I can't remember what exactly it is, but it's like. Oh, yeah. It, wasn't it like like some, some girl walks by? He's like chatting with one of his yeah. friends and like a girl walks by with like a hot dog. And there's like a moment where she's like putting it in her mouth and he's like, oh, <laughs> But it's not a sex thing. It's an, oh, she's got a hot dog. Right. Where, it, where are the hot dogs? He says something like, I've got the munchies. And then he yes. goes into the kitchen. That's what it is. Yes. But he says it like it's a sex thing. But he just literally wants and a hot dog. And then he literally yeah. just wants a hot dog. And then, but then after they kill him, yes. they're still making those hot dogs. Yes, so I started. Eating the hot dogs. I was thinking like, are they using the face water? Yes. Ugh. Maybe. Yeah. I guess you probably wouldn't. You'd probably look and be like, oh, that's, that's we need to boil new hot dogs. I don't know. They make do they make head cheese in Canada? Probably. Yeah, they also do have the great moment where they after he's killed, he's put into the freezer, mm-hmm. and they do the great thing where they open the door but don't yes. see him yes, there. Yes, somebody opens the door and kind of they're still looking at the person they're talking to when they reach for a beer and close it. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There's a couple. Um, I don't. I. I. I kind of want to go back and rewatch because I think that there are two deaths in this movie that mirror stuff those same characters did earlier in the movie. Oh, really? Oh, I never noticed that. So I think the girl who gets put, it turned into a human shower. Sure. Um, I think that's the same girl where in that early scene where all the miners have cleaned up and come back to town and they're greeting all their girlfriends. Mm-hmm. You remember there's one girl who's very, 
the guy she's seeing is very tall and she's pretty petite and he literally like picks her up by the head and kisses her. Oh, you're right. I'm pretty sure that's the same girl that then gets picked up by the head. And I think you might be right. Yeah. Put on a shower spigot. Yeah. And then the way that Howard dies in the mine, um, it's the same thing as the joke he pulls on them in the mine when he scares them. When they're first down there, he he That's swings right. down from yes. the ceiling at them to, to startle them. Yep, except the second time, his head comes off. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of wanted yeah. to like go back and pay a little more attention and be like, are there... I, I don't think they did it as like a full, like, every murder has to do with something the person did earlier. Yeah. But I do think there are these clever little moments in there where I think like the bartender's death is the most obvious one where he set up the dummy to scare them. Right. And then he keeps opening because it's cracking him up. He keeps right. He yeah. keeps opening the door and then finally he does it and it's actually Harry Warden who mm-hmm. actually kills him. Mm-hmm. I appreciate the it's so interesting to me to see these movies these post post um, Friday the 13th mm. pre Nightmare on Elm Street slasher movies mm-hmm. because they're so clearly working off the Friday the 13th template. Yeah. Um, some of them do it better than others. I think this one does it really well. But like it's it's really fun to see Canadian mm-hmm. uh, Evil Ralph or whatever his name is. Crazy Ralph. Crazy Ralph, yes. Um, <laughs> the Harbinger. Yeah, because yeah. he's... <laughs> he's just talking he's just like yeah. at the bar there's this amazing shot where they just cut to him at the bar and he's he's telling the story about harry warden and how crazy he went and they kind of pull back and there's like the captain from long yes, john silvers yes, or like, a, the like a pipe in his yeah. mouth the, just puffing away the captain from the simpsons is there yeah. and yeah. then there's like one of the girls is like waiting for her beers and she's just yeah. like all right man that's okay yeah. Yeah. she's like you can tell this fairy tale as much as you want i just want my beer yeah it's yeah. it's just got it's uh i hesitate to steal a term from a podcast i, I like very much which is mm. with gorley and rust mm. which do cover a lot of horror movies but there's something really cozy about this movie mm. and i think that goes a long way to making it so um enjoyable to watch and so satisfying because yeah. yeah. a lot of these slasher movies are not cozy no they're very abrasive yes especially the as friday the 13th goes on they get very abrasive and very kind of uh, harsh. Yeah. But there's just something about when they they just work better for me, and I assume mm-hmm. you as well, yeah. when they create this atmosphere of that feels lived in and just yes. a little bit more believable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting watching this movie how many bits and pieces I felt like I was seeing of other movies, whether intentionally or not, mm-hmm. and like not saying these were like, direct homages or references but i feel like there's like obviously the friday the 13th one Mm -hmm. the black christmas Mm -hmm. and halloween but also there is something a little bit like jaws about oh sure yeah the you know shut down the dance or yeah yeah. exactly where it's like these town officials kind of hemming and hawing a little bit about what to do Mm -hmm. and so then there's just the people of the town left to deal with this threat that's coming kind of just unstoppably towards them yeah yeah it's interesting because it's like i don't think that that's all intentional fully Mm -hmm. i I mean i don't know maybe some of it is yeah um the final sequence in the mind that like the final chase Mm -hmm. i thought is very well done very um effective yeah the setting of a mine is such a great idea it is for a slasher movie yeah apparently this it was a real mine that mm. is was in Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. It had been recently like decommissioned, and they were going to shut it down. They were going to turn it into a museum, oh, uh, right. which the director was saying he didn't know if that was going to fly because I guess there was a mine museum like four miles in the other direction. So who, <laughs> he said it basically it was going to be a museum, or they were going to just fill it with cement and shut it down. Yeah. <clears throat> and so they scouted this place. They thought it was perfect because mm-hmm. it had like just recently been shut down so mm-hmm. it was still gnarly and stuff and it looked believable yeah yeah um and so they put the deal together to use the mine and then uh when they came back to shoot to their horror they discovered that the town because they're like oh they're gonna shoot a movie in our mine we gotta clean it up which is the <laughs> oh, most canadian thing i've no. ever heard in my life Oh my so god. they cleaned the whole mine and like painted shit and stuff. Oh my god, no! And, so, and they spent like fifty grand <gasps> fixing the mine up, 
and then the production company had to spend like the same amount of money oh to God. make it look shitty like again roughing it up again yeah but it, it, it's just just so hilariously canadian where it's like oh yes. we better clean the mine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna use our mine we don't want them to think it looks bad yeah <laughs> for their horror movie but uh there's lots of great stuff at the end like the uh uh, uh the trolley chase is really well mm, done yeah um i i don't love it's fine I think mm. my least favorite sequence is probably the ladder climbing sequence, just because that kind of hits hits the uh, unnecessary movement button that I don't like. Where it's like we got to go up the ladder, okay, we got to go down the ladder. You know, I don't know. It just yeah. it's I'm I'm being nitpicky, but it's probably my least favorite sequence. See, I I feel like it might be one of those things that probably worked better on the page than it did yeah. in execution, mm-hmm. because I I I sort of. I have a hard time sometimes watching movies and I have to remind myself um, there are periods, there there are scenes in movies where it's supposed to be pitch black. Yes. And you as the person watching, of course, can still see things because mm-hmm. we need to be able to see things right. to know what's happening in the movie. But the characters can't. And I think that was the thing that I had to keep reminding myself of in that scene where it's like, they mentioned when they were going down into the mine that at, at like at the deepest point, this mine goes 2000 feet below ground. Yeah. I don't know how far down they were supposed to be right then, but if that's in the back of your head and it's pitch black and there's a murderer and now you have to just physically climb this ladder, yeah. especially for the girls in like dresses and high heels and hope that you're strong enough and have enough stamina to make it up 2000 feet maybe. Yeah. And it's pitch black. You can't see anything. That sounds terrifying. That mm. sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. But at the same time, when you're an audi- in the audience watching it, it's just like weird shots <laughs> of silhouettes on a ladder and people yelling up and down at each other. Yeah. And then they got to back out of it really quick because Howard's body falls past them. Yeah. Yeah. That Yeah, that makes sense. No. Um, I really like the, the, over- the coverall sequence. Yes. Which doesn't feel like it should be scary, but is pretty effective when they start dropping coveralls down. From yeah. The, yeah, I think it works because the the space that they're in looks so expansive. Like like the room that they're that they're in when that happens looks big. Yeah, and then there's all of these coveralls. It's it's like an industrial laundry, right? I it's, think so. It's like yeah, for all the workers in the mines to cl- clean their clothes and uniforms and whatever. And so yeah, there's just all of these hanging clothing hanging from like chains yeah <laughs> around yeah. the room i don't know if that's how that actually works but it's it's pretty creepy maybe yeah. i don't know but but yeah I, I think i thought that worked really well i was like oh that's a cool looking it almost reminded me of alien yes yeah yeah that like the moment in alien when they're by the like where it's just dripping water for yes. some reason yes yeah. Um, yeah, you know, this, I, as I mentioned, this movie was remade in 2009 as My Bloody Valentine 3D. Um, oh boy, 3D. Yeah, it's not great. And there's something, I don't know if I've mentioned this here before, talked about this before, but it's really been bugging me lately where I watch these older movies. You can, I, I would say you can call this movie a low budget movie. Sure. Um, not the lowest, but lower budget. This movie looks so good <laughs> compared to low budget movies now mm. because it's shot on film. Yeah. And low budget movies now are all shot on video and they all look like trash. Yeah. It's so difficult. I find, like, I, I don't think it's re- people really appreciate how difficult it is to make video look really good Mm -hmm. and how easy it is apparently to make film look really good like even these uh, like i feel like the shittiest horror movie from the 70s and 80s Mm. shot on film there's just something that's more satisfying and feels more tactile and and like of a piece than digital movies which always feel so cold to me and there's just yeah. something that feels a lot more artificial about it. I don't know. I'm just talking out of my ass. But I think I think it's harder to light digital than a lot of people think it is. I was just thinking that, actually, that I think a lot of it has to do with the light. Yeah. Like, the way it's lit, the quality of the light, the way that, like, 
digital tends to sort of just like brighten yeah and and and, and kind of sharpen and clean up everything mm-hmm. um even when you don't want it to right <laughs> like, yeah. which i think is especially difficult when you're trying to make a horror movie because like slashers and horror movies like the darkness and the sort of grittiness of it are part of what makes it scary. Mm-hmm. And so if you have like your, your technology is sort of buffing all of those rough edges away, yeah. it loses. It, yeah. It loses that kind of texture, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and there's also, uh, I was talking about this with a friend of mine once and he was telling me that the difference between the way that they shoot on digital, and the way they shoot on film is that, you can when you're shoot when you're shooting an image mm-hmm. you can always take stuff out but you can't add information in so hmm. when you, a lot of the ways that they shoot now with digital where they have such control over levels in the computer yeah. is they will just light it incredibly bright mm. and then they will just like essentially whittle it down yeah. and, it, and it always makes it feel a lot more unnatural whereas when you're shooting on film it's like you kind of have to make your decisions, right? And live with them, right? There's not as much you can do in post. Yeah, as you, they would you, say you can't, you can't, you can't light a room mm-hmm. like the one we are in right now, right? And then hope to have it look like the Godfather, you know? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's part of it, where it's just like there's, I sound like an old man, but there's <laughs> there's so much information that mm-hmm. it gives you every option. Yeah. Whereas. You you have to make decisions, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you're doing a low budget thing. It's like we need to shoot in a fucking mine, right? Right. We need well, to figure out how we can get four lights down here. Yep. That we can make any of this readable on camera. Right. Oh, and also we only have those lights for two weeks. Right. And yeah. now they've or got whatever. like yeah. you know the floating lights and shit, mm-hmm. and it's just like I don't know. It's 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 just some especially since I've been watching like these Giallo movies and stuff. Mm. They're just so beautifully shot. Yeah. And these are movies that like, I don't know, they're probably all pretty low budget, but they look great. And I would rather watch one of these than most modern horror that's coming out just picture quality alone. That's not to say good stuff isn't coming out because it is, but I don't know. There's just something that is so much more satisfying to me in an older shot on film movie. I do also think that that in some ways the older films can kind of mask a variety of sins in the way yeah. that, that some of the digital stuff can't yeah. because everything is so bright and crisp and clear. Mm. You can't really fudge things quite as easily. I think one of the reasons, I think one of the reasons that you don't see, well, mm. um, one of the, I think one of the reasons you don't see more physical special effects mm-hmm. is because they're harder to do because HD video yeah shows way more seams yes and it looks faker yes whereas in the old old way there's like that patina of yeah. the film that kind of makes everything blend together a little bit better yeah yeah there's almost like a physical another physical level between yeah you the viewer and the picture on the film right like, like yeah yeah so i i think that's that has a great deal to do with it as well is that like maybe if we had fi- if we had been there and we had seen the way some of this was actually set up to be shot we would have been like well and but then because you're sort of working in this lower fidelity medium it is just going to kind of like gently cover over <laughs> some yeah. of the slightly lesser bits here and there it's funny though because like at the same time i think modern filming techniques could allow you to do more um so, like, I'm thinking about that last sequence in the mine. I think mm-hmm. with digital techniques, you could actually push that more to be darker and hmm. and and rely more on the creepiness of the miner with the light on and stuff. Sure. You know, I, and it's I was thinking about that where I was like, I feel like I feel like this is two stops away from being like really scary. Yeah. Yeah. That That's actually an interesting question. Pivoting a little bit. Do you find this movie scary at any point? Not particularly. I think once they get into that final sequence, it yeah. gets pretty tense. Yeah. But like, I I don't ever think that you really reach the the tension or scare levels of mm. like the Halloween yeah. or Black Christmas or even Nightmare on Elm Street. 
And I don't know. I, I don't. I don't find that to be a negative for this. No, no, not necessarily. Because I think the the thing as a whole is just such an enjoyable watch. Yeah. That it doesn't bother me that it's not like terrifying. Yeah, I just thought it was I just think it's interesting for a movie that is like has so has a has a good amount of violence and gore mm-hmm. and is all about somebody going around murdering people. It's actually not that scary of a movie. Yeah. Like there's not really there's like one or two little jump scares, but they're pretty, I think they're kind of telegraphed, mm-hmm. you know, it's like when, when they're kind of first down in the mine and they're all like kind of fucking around and like Howard jumps out at them a couple times or mm-hmm. whatever. It's sort of like you can feel based on these characters that that's coming. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I feel like the only, the only really suspenseful moments were funny enough. I think the bartender playing with his, yeah. his dummy because he kept closing that door and mm-hmm. then opening it again. Mm-hmm. And you knew what was going to happen. You know, you knew he was going to open it one time and the actual Harry, well, actual Harry Warden was going to be there. Um, but you didn't know when. So yeah. there was that time and then there was the the end sequence when they're fighting and you don't know who's going to win. Yeah. <clears throat> I do kind of feel like this movie um, is a little bit of a forerunner to slasher movies that come after it because mm. Harry Warden has a bit of a sense of humor. <laughs> yes <laughs> in a way that that freddie definitely does and jason mm-hmm. will mm-hmm. soon after this mm-hmm. um he's a bit more of a set piece killer than <laughs> than jason is at this point yes uh and there is actually also a very similar uh, i guess it would probably be the same year night uh friday part two does that come out in i think that comes out in 81 right 81 sounds right because they both have that kill where they put the blade through the 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 lovers on top of each other ah yes yes yes, yes. not sure who did it first though <laughs> who Prob- it well best? probably this if it ca- actually this came <laughs> out um like 30 f- however many years from 1981 uh yesterday oh cool so, good timing on our part neat um yeah i guess just to wrap it up <laughs> uh what do you think of the the end bit where they explain to you what is going on <laughs> Who the killer is, why uh-huh. he's doing it. Um, I still don't understand why he's doing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, you know, we, we've kind of covered it in Beats and Pieces of, as we've talked about this, where at the end you find out because TJ knocks the mask off of quote unquote Harry Warden. Mm-hmm. You find out it's Axel and then we get this flashback moment where it's like, ah, Axel saw Harry Warden, the actual Harry Warden, murder his dad. When, yes. when Axel was a child and he's been carrying this trauma around in his head, living a totally normal life until this Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate that they catch you up real quick. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> uh, if you're going to if you're going to hold that reveal until the very end, I don't really want to go super off into a tangent. I want to see what happens. Yeah. It did feel very Italian the way that they it did. did. That. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I still kind of wish it was TJ. I yeah. still think narratively that would have made more sense and been a slightly more interesting turn. Yeah. Because I feel like for most of the movie, we're supposed to be rooting for him. Yeah. And I think, you know, yeah. And I think you are at the end too, because I think, I think the other, the thing, what, ha- what happens differently if it's TJ is I think Axel gets killed. Yeah. And then it becomes about Sarah. Yes. But TJ is ostensibly, the main character of this uh-huh, movie, uh-huh. unfortunately. Yeah. And so it weakest, ends with weakest a, part of the movie, if if you ask me, is TJ. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yes. Yeah. But I also really appreciate his character because it is so weird for a for a lead character. Oh, totally. And I I, I do agree with what you you said a couple uh, something earlier about how like him being the way he is makes the red herring of it maybe being him yeah. plausible. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's something I am like. I don't feel about him the way I feel about some of the Stephen King protagonists sure. we covered on the Patreon episode. Sure. Um, but he is just like <laughs> such a weird dude. Yeah. 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 I um I like how he uh how Axel um once TJ has defeated him and he and he and Sarah are about to leave and they realize Axel's still alive, how he just uh, 127 hours himself in about Very 35 yes. seconds. I Even that scene, I like, well, I mean, it's ridiculous, <laughs> but I like that Sarah has a moment where she goes back because yeah. f- he, he's reaching for her, you know? Yeah. It's, so it's still not as 
cut and dried as this guy was. I mean, I don't right. know why she does, but I mean. <laughs> well, again, it's sort of the cognitive dissonance of like you you've been given new information about a person yeah but you have years of experience and feelings built up about them and it makes it hard for you to believe like oh he is a madman and he killed all of our friends yeah Yeah. like it's still like maybe there was some sort of mistake maybe he's maybe he's sorry (laughs) Mm -hmm. i don't Mm -hmm. know i'm not saying it's logical but i but i buy it you know yeah yeah um him running away with a stump arm deeper into the mine and giggling all the way and singing mm-hmm. little ditties was fun um yeah it does seem like a little bit of a big swing though it is it's a huge swing yeah um <laughs> i i appreciate it because i would rather they take a huge swing than mm-hmm. do something that just kind of falls flat and it's so right weird. like he's crushed in the mind the end yeah it's just so weird that i have to kind of go all right yeah sure <laughs> He just runs back into the mine going, Harry, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we get we get uh played out of the theater by the only the only slasher villain who has an in universe song written about him. What genre would you call that song? Uh Murder Ballad. <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah, actually. A little bit. Sure. I'll buy it. Yeah. All right. I mean, Freddie doesn't get his own song until, well, I guess he has the nursery room. Yeah, he's got the room, but that's not quite the same. He doesn't get a song until part three Mm. when Dawkins shows up Mm -hmm. to a little Dream Warrior action. Jason doesn't get a song until part six when Alice Cooper shows up to let everybody know repeatedly that he's back. Yes. The man behind the mask. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael yep. Myers never got a song. Leatherface never got a song. Michael Myers sh- has ha- doesn't need a song. That's true. Yeah, he's got John Carpenter doing all that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, that music feels like it's in universe. But. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, great song. Uh, very fun. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to hit before we we wrap up? Um, just that somebody uses the phrase "loose hearts" in this movie. Yes, and oh. I can't <laughs> stop giggling about it so i was what are you guys doing with these loose hearts i uh i i was hoping i would have a reason to talk about this story because i just learned about it tonight and i think it's amazing but um i'm just gonna shoehorn it in (laughs) i uh uh, someone i will not name Mm. uh i was told that when this person was in college they had a roommate who would constantly eat the frosting off of the cakes that this person made <gasps> like a dog. Oh. J- I don't I mean I don't mean literally like lick it off, but like anytime oh. a, this person made a cake, this roommate would come in and just eat the frosting off. Oh of it. no. And so as revenge <laughs> to teach this person a lesson. Oh my god. Uh the, this person in question baked a cake <gasps> and frosted it with <laughs> dial uh foamed up <gasps> soap that looked like cake oh, frosting oh my god the roommate came home ate the frosting off the cake because she was apparently shit-faced oh my god and then proceeded to have diarrhea for five days whoa <laughs> whoa whoa, whoa. And then, so <laughs> we were talking about this and and uh the the other person who knew the story is like oh you mean when you poisoned your roommate they were like well i mean i didn't poison them they just they just ate this thing and they had diarrhea for five days like oh poisoned themselves it's like that sounds like a poisoning to me um but i'm sure yeah something something heart in a box i don't know yeah 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 connect it however you want yeah i do really eat other people's sweets yes i do really love the way that i don't know who it is who is it is it the mayor who opens the first heart box? Yes. His reaction is amazing because he... First of all, he is a psychopath who mm-hmm. says he likes Valentine's Day candy more than Christmas candy. Mm. You are insane, sir. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What is Valentine's Day candy typically? It's like weird store-bought chocolate-covered cherries and those chalky little hearts. Well, I mean, you got the the box full of like the Russell Stover's box that yeah. has like the peanut butter stuff in it and you get like the caramels and the different kinds of chocolates sure, and like I the foamy Christmas candy, strawberry though. stuff. Christmas candy is all like chocolate Santas That's true. and like candy canes and cookies and stuff. Why are Christmas Why Easter? are Christmas? Why Goodbye Christmas? everyone. <laughs> Why are Christmas Easter 
and fe- and Valentine's Day mm. so chocolate forward? Money. Yeah, probably. Children. How did Easter money. get in on this game? Like uh, Christmas, I kind of get. Valentine's Day, I kind of get. Easter doesn't feel like a chocolate based holiday, but somehow they managed to get it in there. I mean, Easter is a pagan fertility right holiday. Yeah. So don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean, if you think about it, Easter might make the most sense because you've got like, you know, it's all about like death and rebirth, the, the pagan element, yeah. which is where the Easter bunny comes from, which yeah. I think is fucking hilarious Yes, because they don't tell their kids that shit. No. No. Um, and, you know, you end up having chocolate effigies of this yeah. thing that you're eating. Absolutely. Well, I don't know. It's dying, so you may live. Yeah. Seems more more in line than Paganism. Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, this movie's not on our list. What do you think? Do you think it should go on the list? I kind of do. I do too. Definitely. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that it's not. Yeah. Uh, I don't have like a specific opinion about like where exactly it should go mm-hmm. or what it should bump off, but it feels like something that should be on the list. Yeah, I think I would put this. If nothing, it's got like an iconic looking killer. Yep. Because the whole getup, the, the 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 mine coveralls and the gas mask yeah. and the headlamp, like it, it's a great look. Yeah. It's got a really creepy setting. It's it's got memorable characters in my opinion. Mm-hmm. It's got some great kills. I think it should be on the list. Yeah, I would probably put it. I don't think I'd put it under a hundred. I mm. think I would put it between a hundred and two hundred. I think that's a anywhere in there would be safe sure. to be like, oh yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you found it at one twenty six, <clears throat> and or you found it at one seventy eight, you'd be like, yes, sure. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, the director George Mahalka. I don't know why this guy didn't do more. Mm. I, I don't think this movie did that well when it came out. Mm. But as we were watching this, I was like, I can't believe Paramount didn't grab him to do a Friday the Thirteenth movie because yeah. this movie is very well done. And it's they very were doing effective. So many of those. Yeah, movies. and they were doing them literally every year. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that there is, even though they did already remake it, I think there's room here if you wanted to do something else. Because mm. I kind of think you could probably do an entire movie about the actual Harry Warden story if you wanted to. Yeah, I don't right. know if you, you know, I don't think you need to, but it's, I think it's ground that's open to cover if you chose to do it. See, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree. I feel like this would be kind of tough to, to remake or prequel mm-hmm. now. Because I think there's something about the, the coal mining industry doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> kind of, yes. I well, mean, I mean that could be kind of the point of the movie. <laughs> that that could be, but I feel like then you're you're sort of running the risk of treading back into the like, oh, it's corporate malfeasance that was the enemy all along. Yeah. Um, and I I just I think there's something about the like small townness of this movie that makes it work for me, mm-hmm. and I think that might be ruined a little bit if it was like TJ is an incel who spends too much time on 4chan, right? You know, so I I, I don't know I, I I think it would need to be very carefully handled, mm-hmm. but I don't know what else you could kind of squeeze out of this premise in the modern day that you don't already get done pretty yeah. well in the original yeah i wonder if it's i'm thinking like you could this is one where i feel like you could do a quote unquote remake of the thing kind of angle on it sure where it's you could do the harry warden story mm. as like a you know what's the word i'm looking for uh mm. period piece yeah and just really lean into that whole thing and go nuts. Yeah. Um, I do like the little detail in this movie that the bartender who keeps yelling at them is the one who found him. Mm. Like I love, I, I, I like, like I, I noticed that I rewatched like pieces of it today. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he, he says that he's like, when we were digging them out of the mine, like I'm the one who found it. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, that explains why you're kind of crazy too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I, I mean, if they never touched it, I'd be happy. Mm-hmm. You know, they did it once. I didn't think it was very good. They they remade it once. Yeah. Eh. Yeah. This one feels like a tough one to remake for me. I feel I yeah. feel like there there are some others we've watched that I've been like, yeah, I think you could remake this now and do something really cool with it or, mm-hmm. you know, shift who's the main character or the focus of it or yeah. add in something about, you know, the fan, like, you know, add some new context into it. And this one, I'm kind of like, I don't really know what angle you could approach this 
It takes place in Silicon Valley. At the, it takes at place the in height, a mine on Mars. At the height of the of the internet web boom. And Harry Warden <laughs> the works in, for a, the internet web boom. You know what I mean? Everyone. Like 1998. <laughs> and Harry Warden works for Pets.com, Aww. and then when Pets.com goes under, he goes crazy and kills everybody. Writes itself. Anyway, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, I hit the randomizer button. Beep boop, mm. boop, beep beep boop, beep beep boop. And next up is number 192, which is The Ring. Yay! So that's going to be a fun one. I haven't watched that movie in a long time. Oh, man. I feel like I watched that maybe like early COVID, mm-hmm. kind of just for the hell of it. And I was like, this is definitely more nonsense than I remember, but it still kind of holds up. So <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am too. We both watched Skin of Rink recently. Yes. <laughs> Which I had been describing to people as like if it, it was 90 minutes of the video from the ring. Yes. Which, you know. More or less. Mileage may vary on yeah. what that means to you. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I uh, that's that's a, a solid one. I'm looking forward to revisiting that. So that'll be yeah. fun. Cool. Um, thank you guys for listening. If you want to help support the show, hit up patreon.com slash the Penske file where this year Amanda and I are covering video nasties january Nasty. was dario gento's tenebrae february is possession starring sam neill and isabella johnny which mm-hmm. is a pretty fucked up weird movie so yeah. <laughs> but a lot of screaming so make sure you have good volume control but mm. um so yeah you guys can enjoy that and amanda thank you for joining me thank you Bye. and we'll see you guys next time Bye, everyone. from long time ago and no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago.